Sound Design. Live. Welcome to Sound Design Live. Today I'm here with the director of audio from IMS Technology Services, Chris Leonard. Chris, welcome back to Sound Design Live. It's great to be back. So, if you want to know about Chris's life touring with Tears for Fears, uh, how he got started in the industry, going to school, all that stuff, you should listen to the interview we did a year ago. It's a really good one. Um, but today we're going to be talking about two very specific things, which are a giant parade that you worked on and um, about getting work in the industry and, and maintaining relationships and, and kind of best practices um, for that kind of stuff. So, Chris, I would love to start off with some music, though, first. So you told me this is we're, we're spoiling it a little bit, but. What is the song that you listened to a thousand times in a row while you were testing this parade route? <laughs> That'd be Daft Punk's Fragments of Time. Not very many of us are ever going to work on an event this large. Maybe once or twice in our career, something like this comes up. And so we're not talking about this to sort of, I think, give people advice on like, what to do in this situation. It's more that it's just fun to talk about things that are kind of at their height of complexity. You know, like Chris works on uh, big and small and medium-sized events all year long. Um, and then the ones we end up talking about usually are the ones that have a lot of complexity because, you know, those are the ones that are that are sort of interesting to, to try and break down and look at what your decision process is going to be. So I just wanted to say that because I think sometimes I know when I see people's Facebook posts or, or hear other uh, read articles or hear other people's podcasts about some giant project they worked on, I kind of feel like, well, I'm never going to work on that. So why should mm-hmm. I be interested? And um, so I don't want to make people feel left out like, like they're not working on a parade and therefore they're unsuccessful. Yes, this is a large scale event, but there's still principles that you're just taking the same principles you already know and just exploding them and magnifying them and, and making it on a, on a bigger scale. So, um, I mean, that's the only reason I was able to put together successfully something like this is having, I, I was fortunate enough to work on the last four inaugurations, but I didn't design that, right? So uh, not many people have designed a system for a million or more people, right? But you may have worked with alongside larger events and you're just scaling that up. But I think there are things you can take from that. And even though someone else might listen to this, might not do something of that size, they could listen to it and go, okay, I could apply this here. I could apply this there. Uh, And same thing. There's things I learned on this that I could still apply to a scale, a quarter the size of this. What was happening a year and a half ago that um, was the genesis of this project? So the Philadelphia Eagles uh, were going to the Super Bowl. In In Minneapolis. Your hometown. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And uh, so there's, there's two weeks between the, the, um, uh, the last playoff game in the Super Bowl. And so after a week had lapsed, so basically a week before the Super Bowl, we got contacted by the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, we do a lot of work with them. Uh, we are their provider, AV provider in their stadium uh, for corporate events that happen within the stadium or um, other events that they may have outside of game day. And they said, hey, uh, if we win, uh, we have to plan for a parade. Uh, we think it's going to be a very historic parade and that it's the first time we would have, if we win, we would have won in 52 years. Um, and it probably will be the largest event in Philadelphia history. When we got the call, it was like, um, okay, we need to plan for about, I don't know, a million to 2 million people to show up to this thing. <laughs> Anywhere from a million to 2 million. Yeah. I mean, cause how do you Pretty know? Wide you're, range. Not, you're, not, you're not, you're not selling tickets, you know, you're not whatever. And, and you're not going to know until Sunday night when that clock stops, whether this thing ha- is going to happen or not. So people aren't making, you know, travel plans ahead of time, all that stuff. It's, you know, it's a very last minute thing, but has to be prepared for Cause if it happens, it's a go. If it doesn't, well, better luck next year. And we all know what happened. Everywhere. <laughs> they won. The Eagles won. The Vikings stayed at home sad. Um, and so the first time the Eagles had won, everyone in Philadelphia, I'm sure, is going nuts. And they're like, 100% this parade is happening. 
Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, any, I mean, anytime any team wins, there's going to be a parade for them. So you know, there's going to be a parade. It's just a matter of to what scale and what's going to happen for sure. Okay. Cool. So let's get into the design and the planning a little bit. First of all, how did you get the gig? Why are you the person that designed, uh, installed, optimized, and mixed the show? So, like I said, combination of IMS Technology Services, which is where I work. Uh, we are the Eagles AV provider. Mm-hmm. Um, so they came to the company as a whole, um, and then part of it is that they know some of the scale of work that some people at IMS, including myself, have done in the past, like working on the past four inaugurations and other larger events where a million or more people have been there. So we've at least had, um, you know, collectively have had some experience behind us to pull something off like this. Right. And we talked about in the last interview that you uh, worked for Maryland Sound. You have worked on some of the presidential inaugurations. So you have an idea of uh, the scale and of what is required for this kind of event. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like I said, I didn't, I haven't designed anything with inaugurations or something to this scale, but I've been a part of being system teching uh, and being involved in and picking the brain of those who have, you know, each for those, each for those inaugurations. I mean, I did every day was my goal was to pick the brains of the people that were there uh, to glean what I can from them. And I think that is what helped pay off and being able to um, pull this off. If you're listening to this podcast right now, we there's going to be a video portion of this because Chris told me ahead of time, I think this is going to be hard to explain. So I said, okay, well, let's do a video as well. So Chris is going to be describing it, but we're also going to be looking at um, some pictures. So if you're having a hard time picturing what we're talking about, go take a look at the video, which will be on the you know, the show notes page for this podcast at sounddesignlive.com. And then I guess I want to know what the Eagles said to you. What were the requirements of yeah. the well, show? And, and, and that's actually what this picture does. Okay. Okay. Right. So a, a week out from the Super Bowl, we get the call and said, hey, in a week, if if they win, uh, we need to be ready, right? So we have to plan out this victory parade uh, as if it's happening, have everything in motion so that when Monday morning after the game ends, if they win, we are loading in. And typically the, the parade will be on a Wednesday. So you have two days to set up and then the parade's the third day, right? Um, and so we had a week to put together something which would normally take months to a year sure. typically to plan logistically. Because it Again, we're only talking about the audio side of things, right? Um, you have a whole city to coordinate on this. Everything from law enforcement to um, to video screens to um, uh, just entertainment. Like the, the, the amount of coordination is insane across the city. Um, but even just from an audio standpoint, it's like, okay, well, uh, where do you, you know, my first question, where do you think people are going to be and how many? And they said, I don't know. They, <laughs> they said, they, I, they don't said know. I don't know. <laughs> it's going to be, we expect people to be everywhere. Um, uh, well, specifically the parade route was um, was going to start at the stadiums in Philadelphia, come up the center of the city through what's called Broad Street, and it makes a left and comes down um, Ben Franklin Parkway, which ultimately ends at the bottom of the Philadelphia Museum of Art steps, a.k.a. the Rocky Steps. Right. Um, and, uh, so that's where the stage was going to be. The stage was going to be at the, um, in the middle of the steps and, uh, they, they call this area the Eakins Oval. Um, and so I, I kind of made myself a heat map as you see here, um, and kind of just labeled some zones to say, okay, I think I need to cover these areas. Um, and I actually went, I did that just in the colors and zones before I went down there and said, Hey, is this kind of what you're thinking? You know, and they, you know, they said yes. Um, and, uh, and so the numbers you start to see on the screen, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, um, were after I went back to the shop and started designing, these were pole locations and by poles, uh, Maryland sound has these poles, uh, that you can deploy very easily, uh, outdoors. Um, it's got a, and I forget the exact height, like a 45 foot height, you know, um, peak to the pole. You can hang anywhere from a, a one to three line arrays, you know, off of it. 
um, and you can deploy them very fast. They were designed for stuff like the inauguration, Times Square, New Year's Eve, you know, these large outdoor events. You don't want to take up much footprint, had to be deflo- deployed fast. Um, so I knew that this was the route we had to go. I had a relationship with Maryland Sound, obviously having worked there. Um, having to build SCAF or any other thing for this would have taken way too long. Mm. Like This needed to get set up in two days. So what happens? It comes in on a long truck and then they just tilt it up? Yeah, yeah. It comes, in, crane? On, it comes in on a long uh, flat, uh, it comes in on a flatbed. You get four poles per flatbed. Um, and they're in two pieces. There's a 10,000 pound concrete base. And then you have the, the pole. Um, and you use... Um, uh, walls, or, which are um, long extending boom uh, forks, and pick them up um, literally with span sets, drop it on, bolt it. Uh, for people who've been doing it often, it's actually, it, it, you know, two guys can put up, you know, four four poles in an hour or two. It, wow. It's really quick. Okay. You couldn't do that with scaffolding or anything else. Um, so I knew I would have that at my disposal. So I just started saying, <laughs> first thing I said to them is, hey, how many are available? <laughs> Right, because you need to know that. Um, and the magic number we landed on was around 15 of those poles. And then so I started adding, you know, boxes to those poles. And so the coverage that I had to do was everywhere from uh, City Hall, mm-hmm. which is in like the center of the city, all the way down the parkway to the art museum steps. So if you actually did this calculation, it was a little over a mile straight shot of audio. Okay. All right. Um, so. I placed the poles uh, up front in by the oval. It was a little more concentrated um, because I had you know more you know, uh, concentrated amount of audience there, VIP, whole nine yards. Um, and then as it went down, we went down the center of the parkway because I knew the parkway would be clear, right? Uh, and I spaced my poles about 400 feet apart. Um, and then once I got to my last... Um, when I was out of poles, basically, we used more laws to hang more arrays, an, another four arrays, four or five arrays past where I had laws uh, to cover a mile okay. of space. And did you just work your way from left to right? And um, you were using these shapes in Vectorworks to say like, okay, if I place this here and it's at this distance, what's the shape? And and then you just kind of filled it in from left to right like that? Yeah, absolutely. And obviously having the map in here is a big deal, right? There's some gaps in coverage. That's because, you know, loose gaps in coverage because I knew, hey, people can't physically stand here. And uh, and this is also still kind of rough. Like we tweak things on site. This was more of just a broad stroke. Okay, I know I can kind of cover this area. I didn't maybe exactly do these aimings. I kind of tweaked it a little bit. But yeah, this was at least, you know, to make sure that I had enough to kind of cover you know, what was going on. Okay. Uh, and I'm assuming IMS doesn't have these tower, these, uh, giant poles. They probably also don't have all the speakers that would hang on those poles. Yep. That's correct. Uh, so we had some, some of the PA and then the rest of it, uh, came from Maryland sound as well. We had, I had 240 some VTX 25s and, you know, uh, VTX V twenties mixed out throughout, throughout this. So it was as close to 300, some line array boxes to kind of cover, all of this, uh, anywhere from like eight deep hangs, uh, six deep hangs, kind of dependent on the area that I had to had to cover. Wow! And for you said a mile and a half, uh, a little over, just over a mile. So for a mile, you can't just run out a mile of XLR. How are you getting audio transport from? Tower to tower. Right. So uh, not only was there audio, but there was like LED trucks almost at every pole location as well or every other. Right. So they needed to get, you know, video signal down as well. Um, So there was a third party company that we brought in to transmit uh, video and audio over RF. uh, And luckily it's a straight shot. Right. And so they had built a tower down near front of house and shot RF down the parkway. And we picked up our signal. There was a receiver at each LED truck and we pick up our receiver there and get our signal to hit distribute to each of the poles from there. Okay. So it was all wireless, but someone else kind of handling that part of it for you, which Mm -hmm. is nice. And it was solid. Yes. All right. Awesome. Cool. What do you, what do you want to talk about next with this design? Um, Let's see. So I guess we can kind of look at kind of look what the scopes people kind of, if, oh, people, sure. if people haven't yeah. seen this, right? So this is uh, the concentration of people all up in what we call Econ's Oval. You can kind of see the stage up here in the middle. Uh, this is actually the parade route coming along. Uh, all the uh, Eagles players uh, and team riding the buses up up the way. Uh, and this is this is kind of just up front, right? This is only the you know first quarter of the audience. Uh, and it just, it was concentrated like this all the way down the parkway. Uh, and I'm somewhere inside that white tent. (laughs) 
And can you zoom in on one of the poles? Yeah, actually, well, it might be a little sure. easier to do this. Okay. You can kind of see them like this. So oh, you get a better, better picture of the poles. This is uh, kind of front, behind front of house looking down. This building you see here is City Hall. Oh, and it's cold. This is January, right? Oh, huh, yeah, February. Uh, <laughs> oh, February. Monday and Tuesday weren't bad, um, although they were calling for bad rain on Wednesday, right? Um, so uh, they pushed the, uh, the parade to Thursday, which worked in our favor um, because it gave us an extra day to actually tune things. So we had everything 100% ready to go. By the end of the day, Tuesday, Wednesday was, um, I should say everything was working. Wednesday was our time alignment and, um, you know, just, you know, tweaking and making sure everything's ready to go um, and be ready for Thursday morning at 5 a.m. or whatever our call time was on that, that, that early morning, <laughs> on, on Thursday morning. So it was supposed to rain a lot on Wednesday. So did it? Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm imagining you, what, like under an umbrella, like going around you know, listening to all these speakers? Right. So um, so t from a, you know, from a time alignment standpoint, I can kind of go back to the uh, the front here. Working in this oval, I, I, you know, I was able to use smart and a mic and kind of put, you know, a couple hundred, hundred feet of mic cable and actually kind of time align this section as you would any other venue just happen to be an outdoor once you start getting, you know, beyond four or five hundred feet and going down the parkway, um, it, it's, it's kind of difficult to do. So, yes, it was pouring down raining most of the day, uh, full full rain gear, but that doesn't stop you from getting soaked because you're just standing in it all day. Um, and so uh, me and the team, uh, we just we started at the first pole at well, first of the parkway, which would have been pole 10. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we did all our timing up here, uh, through our system processor and then our system processor fed the RF that was shooting down, down the parkway. The, we delayed that signal going to the RF for the time alignment of this first pole. And then beyond that pole, everything was receiving it, its time zero was 10, right? So at each pole, we then did the delay in the amplifiers to stack on top of that delay to work our way all the way down to City Hall. And what was like a maximum amount of delay once you get a mile away? I think we were a little over three seconds. Okay. <laughs> and can I guess you can do that much delay in an amplifier? Well, not within the amplifier, but because you already started, you know, like that, that for, this first pole is already, I don't know, six, eight hundred feet from the, you know, the, the beginning. You already have that delay on top of it, right? Okay. Um, so it was, it really was stacked delays to get to that point. Got it. Yeah. Wow. And, and so then to do that, since you couldn't get uh, a microphone out there and continue using smart, you told me that you were basically just walking around listening to making your best judgments. Yeah. Um, so what we did is uh, we at least started with just, you know, Google Earth and said, okay, this pole to this pole is 400 feet. This pole to this pole is, you know, the, ne the next footage did the rough drop ins of those across as a starting point. Right. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, you just had to walk it, uh, and, uh, and just, and listen, right. Cause there was going to be a little bit of a seam between the two. Um, and I wanted it to be a cohesive system to work together across the whole parkway. Cause you know, sound doesn't just stop. <laughs> right. So if it wasn't at least somewhat timed, it would have been a nightmare. You know, if you're halfway down the parkway, it, you would just be hearing things three, four, five times. And I did not want that. Um, the NFL draft was in the same location a year prior. Uh, and there were a lot of complaints on how the audio was handled, uh, in the oval. Right. And so actually one of the biggest compliments that we got from the major networks there, uh, they said that, uh, you know, they said the city learned their lesson and they got it right this time. <laughs> they didn't know that that was us or me or my team. Uh, but the, I, I took it as a big compliment that it was recognized that, you know, it, you know, somewhat similar event happened with a lot of people in the same space wasn't done well before. Um, and that this was for all intents and purposes, flawless. Wow. 
Congratulations! It's like, amazing. Yeah, no, it it it, it was it, it felt very well, uh, very good to to be able to pull this off. Uh, I I would not have been able to do it by myself. Um, Aram, my right hand man, in terms of my system tech and helping me design. I mean, him and I worked together on designing this and coming up with um, all the networking and and all of those all those details. Uh, without him and the rest of the guys, IMS team and stagehands, you name it, all of them coming together, it was of course not just me. Okay. Um, and so just to finish up the talk about the fine tuning and doing the listening, if you were listening to this track over and over again, um, and were you just sort of listening and you were fine tuning, were you just, you know, the track so well, you're just listening for like tonal changes and you know when it sounds right. And so you can say, Hey, try this and try that on, yeah. over the radio. Yeah. A combination of both. I mean, uh, the track that we mentioned earlier was uh, Daft Punk's uh, Fragments of Time. I don't yeah, the song is a very it's a very musical song, so it's a very well-rounded song. Um, but it has some very tight, you know, percussion. The, the drums are you know cut right through it. The, the snare hit and the kick hit, right? So I was really just using the percussiveness of that to kind of line things up. You know, you and I talked it. You know, sure, could I do this with a metronome? Absolutely. But this was across you know hours of timing, um, and I didn't want it to be. Uh, um, I also used to use the music to kind of feel out the coverage. You know, Metrodome is not really going to kind of tell you what your coverage feels like. So if I need to splay a speaker out a little bit further, you know, or shade a bottom box or something like that, so I can kill two birds in one stone or more birds in one stone mm -hmm. by using music. Um, you know, and, and look, we're talking ballpark, right? It's like, oh, hey, take off 30 milliseconds. No, wait, add 15 milliseconds. This isn't like, you know, you know, half of millisecond timings. We're talking, you know, this is broad brush strokes of timing, you know, just enough that it's it's not completely smeared and off. Awesome. Um, and then the day of, you were at front of house, in front of those steps. Um, talk to me about the mix setup here and and what happened that day. Yeah, so I had a CL5 as my main desk and then a QL5 as a backup. So we double patched all of our inputs, all of our outputs uh, for redundancy uh, for something like this. Uh, not that I would foresee either board failing uh, because they're very solid boards, but you just never know at any given time something could happen. Um, and I didn't want to be responsible for an event like this, you know, a simple thing, just taking out my system. Um, uh, thankfully, it was not necessary. Uh, but nonetheless, it was there. Um, yeah, so a front of house uh, luckily had a great a great view. Uh, leading up to the actual um, stage, they were starting all the way back at the other end of the city, right? So they actually replayed the game for everyone while they're waiting to kind of like oh get them God, hyped up awesome. and re, re, relive <laughs> the experience, right? You know, um, I mean, people doing the Eagles chant, you know, over and over and over <laughs> again. Um, the atmosphere was insane. Like, just to be a part of that, you know, I'm not originally an Eagles fan. Uh, I'm originally from Maryland, so I'm I'm a Ravens fan. How, however, uh, Eagles giving me the largest gig of my career. I'm pseudo a, a fan because of that now. You know, better be. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, you know, I mean, it was it was a it was a fun season to kind of follow with everything they had to do to get there. I mean, they were they were the underdogs the whole nine yards. Um, and then uh, like the the peak of the of the ceremony was uh, this guy, Jason Kelsey, their, their center, uh, who's kind of the inspiration of the team, gave what most people would consider, you know, quote unquote, an epic speech. Right, um, and it, I think you consider it an epic speech. Oh, I do too. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I mean, if if I'm ever down or I need to get like pumped up, I can just go watch that <laughs> in, instantly. Go back to that in my head and be like, yes, uh, it was one of the hardest I've ever worked from a podium microphone uh, perspective. Oh, right, because this is like a single input practically to 300 outputs. Right, exactly. Uh, so did the typical dual 57 presidential setup, right? Um, you know, to get the full experience of this picture that I'm showing of uh, Jason Kelsey at the lectern, just 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 search Jason Kelsey speech Eagles parade and you'll you'll find a bunch of versions of it out there. Um, so in terms of sports history and Philadelphia sports history is a pretty iconic speech. Uh, so the owner of our company wanted to kind of uh, memorialize that. So he kept he had us keep the uh, the microphone um, clip and stand and mics, and he kind of mounted it and made a made a trophy out of it. That's and it's, hilarious. It's in it's in his office, and it's uh, and what's cool is Jason Kelsey got wind of this, thought it was really cool, and he wanted one also. 
so we made a, 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 a replica of it. Now, I know there are people listening right now who are saying, what, 57's presidential? What are you talking about? So I don't know how far this goes back, uh, but as long as I know it's gone back, that the White House Communications uh, has set the standard that um, the presidential microphone needs to be a, a 57, a Shure SM57. Um, they will never do a um, condenser microphone. They, won't any, they don't want any chance for voltage being there or just any chance of phantom power going out. At some point, you know, the dual microphone became a thing. Uh, and it was a standard for the longest time until our current president who decided to change it. He didn't like that. Um, and so he now uses a single 57. Okay. And ultimately I, I'm realizing this probably ended up helping you to have something, uh, I'm going to say more rock and roll because you were telling me about some of the people, especially I think this guy in the picture screaming basically into the microphone. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, okay. no one's just kind of sitting back and like, ah, la 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 talking. No, no. Like, I mean, the energy is insane, <laughs> right? The energy is insane. And I mean, they are centimeters away from that diaphragm ripping into it. Uh, and so, yeah, so everything from dynamic EQ on the channel to just overall compressor and gain, I was riding all those things, you know, from speaker to speaker to speaker, because you got varying heights of people and everything. Luckily I, had gained for days just given the design and the space i had so it wasn't more of just not having enough game before feedback it was making sure basically i didn't overload the microphone overload the system and distort um and also not sound super squashed and compressed too right okay. you want it sure. to you know that's where the dynamic eq comes into play um and uh that way you're only compressing you know that low end that's really getting built up when they when they get in there but when they back away it still sounds the same because you've only compressed the low end you haven't just squashed the whole channel what's the audio transport here locally uh before it goes wireless out to the podiums uh so Sorry, out of, stands yeah out of out of out of our cl5 we go into um our system processor uh, which we actually use probably a little unconventional way of doing it which is a bl uh, bss blue 806 um which is like open architecture thing uh, but it allows me to have um tons and tons of zones and uh, flexibility in, in routing and then it was Dante all around this space until you went to the um, poles? Yes. Yeah, actually. Well, and even the poles that are around uh, around us um, all had uh, um, had re uh, red net boxes that were uh, receiving Dante and distributing to all of the, um, the iTech amplifiers that would have been powering the VTX. Yeah. Okay. Um, and remind me how far on a network cable can you transmit with Dante? Uh, or were you switching to fiber somewhere? Oh, yes. Yeah, okay. it definitely would have been fiber for most of it would have been fiber. So, I mean, uh, 300 feet, you know, you're not going to want to go beyond that um, on uh, Cat 5. But fiber, I can go for miles. Wow, that's amazing. Um, and we're actually in Houston, Texas right now. That's right. And we're working on another show that is also using fiber. And I have never seen how in the system that works. Is there just another box that converts... Uh, cat five to fiber or how does that hardware work so the switches in our racks um sg 300s sg 350s um they have fiber ports that uh, will link other switches so so within each of our rear racks has has those cisco switches you run fiber from that cisco switch to another cisco switch and then it turns it back into cat five let's Stop talking about technology for a minute and let's start talking about um, business stuff. I guess what I want to talk about are the things that you don't like and the things that you do like in terms of the way people uh, do outreach with you. And we are in a perfect position because you are director of audio, also a project manager, and... Um, I am a freelancer, and so I'm often doing outreach to people like you to kind of remind you like, hey, I'm alive, and I'm available to do this kind of work, and here are the things that I like to do. So this is important to talk about because Pro Audio, as we all know, is built on personal referral. Um, there is no central marketplace where we all go to uh, meet each other and hire each other yet. Um, and so what happens with most people like you that need to do a lot of hiring of labor is that you have your own personal list of people that you work with. Um, and just to kind of 
bring people up to speed who haven't maybe read any of my other articles or listened to other podcasts. What generally happens, or read the book Get On Tour,、um, there's a good explanation of this in there. But what generally happens is that when there is a client and there's a job to be done、um, and we need labor to work on it, then whoever's in charge, in this case, director of audio or could be a project manager,、um, you know, different people have different titles who handle human resources and hiring at different companies, and, and we should go through those titles as well. What they want to do first is work with known quantities, right? They want to work with gear that they know and know how to use, and they work, want to work with people that they've already worked with. Makes sense, right? So,、um, especially for heads of department, your A1s, your、uh, L1s, V1s, the people who are doing the hiring are going to reach out to people that they know already.、Um, and, you know, especially if it's an, on an event that they're doing for the second time. Hey, I already worked with Nathan previously.、Uh, we're doing the same event.、Uh, let's try and get him again and see if he's available. Unfortunately, this is, you know, one to one. And it, Doesn't scale so well when you're doing something like this parade we talked about, other large conventions where you potentially need to hire. Like, how, how many people would you need to hire on, on some of these bigger events? I don't know, 50, 100? Yeah.、Uh, yeah. I mean, key positions, it wouldn't be that high. I mean, you have your, you know, your local. But for a day, there's potentially how, how many people total working at these places? Yes. You know, anywhere from you know, 10 to 50 to 60. Yeah,、okay. it depends. Heads of department, you go one to one. And then as you get kind of lower, let's say in rank, I don't know a better way to say it, you're A2, A3, A4, A5,、uh, et cetera.、Um, you kind of either run out of time、uh, or patience、um, to work on this stuff, or you run out of contacts in your address book. So even though Chris has hundreds of people in his address book, he's not going to go through all hundreds of them to hire all of those positions. Privately,、um, he's going to then start working with、uh, the union, local labor bookers. Is everything I've said so far true? Or did I make any mistakes? Yeah, yeah. So, the easiest way to do it to be to break down our process, right? So, I, I can't necessarily speak for how other companies book their labor and the, the avenues that they go through or the processes they go through.、Uh, so, the way it works for us is we have directors for all our departments, director of audio, video, and lighting.、Uh, we have a labor coordinator and we have an operations manager. So, collectively, that team is、uh, finding, sourcing all of the labor for all of our shows.、Um, the production managers who manage the,、um, the project,、uh, they have you know, put the quote together with a sales rep,、uh, have sold you know, to a client and says, hey, it's going to take X amount of people to execute the show. And that's A1, V1, whatever other positions. And then X amount of utility labor, stage hands for load ins, load outs. Um, and so then we meet、um, once a week, if not more than once a week, and go over that list. So, hey, well, here's what's coming. Here's what's the next two weeks. Here's three months. Here's four months out. Sometimes it depends.、Um, they say, okay,、um, obviously, first and foremost, we're going to employ our full timers and figure out what shows our full timers are going to go on, right? We want to have at least one full timer on every one of our shows. Right. You guys have employees that, in specific departments. Like you mentioned, Aram. So he's doing audio on a lot of shows. And for every department, they have employees who are just out almost exclusively just working on shows. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, our goal obviously is to keep those guys out working on shows you know, for us,、uh, doing things the IMS way.、Um, and so, and then, but the volume of shows we're doing, there's, we, we can't, we wouldn't be able to staff that amount of full timers, right? So we have to sprinkle that in with freelancers. So,、um, so yeah, so when there's a need, there's a shortage,、uh, it, you know, our, Our labor coordinator says, Hey, Chris, I need A1 for this show in this city for these dates, you know?、Um, and uh, so that I,、uh, I'm responsible for booking that person. You know, and a couple key things go into that. I have to figure out, okay, A, what city is it in? B, is there travel involved or not?、Um, and、uh, those, are, those, are, those are two big factors. And the third would be just be, you know, what type of show is it? You know, are we talking a breakout room with a single mixer and two speakers? You know, are we talking a general session for 2,000 people, right? What type of gear is in there?、Um, and so, uh, so I, have to, I have to break those things down to, okay, I can't travel. It's this level of show. So I go to my list of people in that city and go, okay, I think, let's、uh, we'll say, we'll、say this is not a non reoccurring event.、Um, and、uh, say, okay,、uh, I, I think this, per- I know this person has this skill set. I'm going to text, email that person, say, hey, are you available? 
yes, no. Um, and then if that person's not, that's when it starts getting harder or the, the first two, three people aren't available. I'm either making a decision, okay, I'm, I'm pretty sure this guy can, can handle this. I would have rather this other guy do it, but I'm going to go with this guy because the other guys aren't available. I don't typically do what I call a cattle herd or a cattle call of just a mass text or a mass email and say, who's available to, to do this call? That's more of a, a labor broker thing. You know, I, I'm, I'm hand selecting this person, all right, they're not available, moving to the next, moving to the next. Um, and, and I think that's also what's nice for the freelancers, though. If I ask them, um, I, I'm waiting for a response to them. So if they don't respond right away, they don't have, they don't feel obligated. Like, oh, if I don't respond to him right now, I'm going to miss out on this gig, <laughs> right? I, I, and again, I can't speak for other companies, but for me, that's just kind of how I operate. And one thing that's interesting for me about you is that you're – list of contacts then breaks down further into not only people that you've worked with on a um, one-on-one basis and that you know um, you've seen their face in real life and worked on a show with them and those are the people that you want to go to first but you've now also started incorporating people that you just know online so tell me how that works yeah so i heavily use linkedin um i didn't for the longest time um and uh, and i mean other social channels as well but from a from a business standpoint uh linkedin is very powerful um i've i've i started basically accepting invites from if, if you're remotely in the industry and you send me an invite i'm hitting accept right so i i may not know three quarters of the people who are in my quote unquote you know connected linkedin um but what it allows me to do is a couple of things one if i'm going to a city let's say it's say it's phoenix i can search you know audio engineer uh change the location to phoenix and now i have my six eight ten whatever guys in phoenix that i know are, are, are a one so if they're not regular, so the name's not my radar, but I see, oh, okay, you know, it reminds me, this guy's there, right? I, I can right. go down that way. Um, the other thing LinkedIn does for me is um, guys who are active on LinkedIn, um, you know, I can kind of see the work they're doing, right? So I, I mean, I may not know who you are, but you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm observing what type of work you're putting out there. Um, I can kind of gauge where I think your level of, of, of ability is, um, what types of clients you're working with. I'm going to be more inclined to use you if I, I'm kind of seeing what, what's that, what that, what that looks like. Um, and I, there's been quite a few guys who I, I just, you know, followed them for a little while on LinkedIn and the, the time came, Hey, I need somebody in this city. Um, uh, Phoenix actually is a good example example of that for me for a couple guys um and so yeah it, it's a very powerful place to kind of be in front of me but um not obnoxious with you know an email every day of hey got any work you got any work uh here's my availability here's my availability right it's it's um you know i'm on linkedin daily right so if you're posting things and you're active and you're connected i'm gonna see it okay so if we were to start kind of making a list of things you do like um they are um, first of all, being connected that way you're a first level connection mm -hmm. and you can message me and you can see my contact information. Um, and second of all, you see that I'm actively working. So I'm not just sort of pretending to be a sound engineer, right? I'm actually working on shows and, and what sort of posts do you think are attractive? I, I don't know. It, it doesn't need to be fancy or super entertaining, I guess, but, um, uh, I think we were talking yesterday about how it should be authentic, right? Like I shouldn't be pretending that I'm doing something that I'm not. Can you say something about that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's definitely a difference of, um, you know, if, uh, if you're an up and coming person, uh, and you're on a show site, um, you're taking a bunch of pictures, uh, and, uh, and you post them, there's ways of wording it as if, Hey, I was part of the team where I helped make this happen versus, you know, making it look like you were the guy or whatever. Um, and, uh, after some time, you can kind of see through what, you know, where someone is with that. Uh, and so I, and I, I prefer people who are authentic with what, what, what they're posting. Um, uh, that way it's not a, a false sense of, oh, this guy has been doing this or, or sorry, I don't just mean guy, this tech has been doing this, yeah. you know, this tech's been doing that. Um, and, uh, yeah, so just, uh, and as far as what, what I like to see uh, everything, you know, um, I, I don't just want to see the console you're behind every day. Right. Uh, and cause it's not, it's not just about, um, you know, the fact that you're a sound person, I want to know, you know, well, what's the scale of the event you're working on. Right. I don't want to just see your rack back a house. Right. Or if you are an A2, 
I want to see how organized your A2 world is. You know, are you using RF10s? Are, are you using this? You know, you know how how I'm well not using RF10s. <laughs> <laughs> how, how 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 well uh, are uh, how how well are things laid out? You know, how organized are you? You know, even on a one-off show, you know, I want to see those types of things. So, um, and, and look, you know, you know, LinkedIn or social is not necessarily for everyone, uh, but for those who are on there, um, it, it is a great resource. And it's a great avenue. Um, plus. Um, you know, things can catch on pretty quickly, right? You, you know, it's not just me looking at it, right? There's a bunch of other companies looking at it. So, um, it's, uh, it's, it, it, can, it can go a long way in showing and, and growing. And I, so, and also I, I don't just follow freelancers as well. I follow every production company possible that I think does decent, right? So I'm observing how this production company decided to design the system for this show. I'm just, you know, what gear did they use? What decisions did they make? I'm also looking at it from a marketing standpoint. Oh, how are they marketing themselves? What language are they using? What pictures are they using? Because I do some of the social media marketing for, for our company as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm not just scouting freelancers. I'm also scouting other companies. Hey, they're kind of doing things this way. That might be good, might be bad, you know, and trying to glean, glean stuff from that. Two things that struck me yesterday that you kept saying are, I think, the two most important reasons for being authentic and, and why it's it's just easier to actually post about the things you're really working on and the level that you're really working at and your level of understanding um, is that, number one, as you already mentioned, you can see through it pretty easily um, if someone's not being authentic. And number two, you need people at every level, so you don't just need all super specialized A1s who only work with some specific equipment or something, you need breakout techs, you need A2s, you need all these different positions at all these different levels. Um, and so I'm starting to understand that, that it'll be a lot easier for me to communicate with you and also probably get more calls from you if I'm always saying like, here's the level that I'm at, here's the things that I'm doing. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't want to accidentally get hired for the wrong thing. And then it ends up, you know, being a problem. And then, you know, you never hire me again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, so for instance, um, there's kind of two ways of going about that. One is, yes, I do need, I need someone who can be an A1 for, you know, this massive show. I also need people who can be a basic AV, AV tech for, you know, a simple breakout room with two wireless mics and a speaker, you know, and it's not just about knowing the gear, you know, it's about, um, uh, personality and how you can handle a client and those types of things. But yeah, so, uh, if I'm unsure, if I'm unsure of, how a tech is maybe because they don't have much information on LinkedIn or just, I just don't know much about them, but I, I've heard their name. Like, Hey, here's an audio guy that's in X city. Right. Um, I got a large breakout show. Uh, I'm going to put them on as a breakout tech in the mix of people that I know and then get feedback on them. Right. And then I use it as, almost as a farm system. Okay. I, I get a gauge on what this person can do. Right. And then, and then next, next time I come around, okay, I can give this guy, sorry, this, this tech sure. more responsibility. Um, or no, Hey, this is where this person's at and it's okay. You know, it's, it, there's nothing wrong with being, you know, but I would rather it be honest and upfront. Like, Hey, I'm not comfortable with doing X. I'm not comfortable with doing this. This is where my, my comfortability is. I will respect that way more than for you to read me back the manual and be able to say every terminology but as soon as the CEO comes up and you just put that mic on there and you haven't strung it through his shirt or her shirt or whatever, um, just simple things like that, like, you know, they go, you know, it's, it's gonna be a problem. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a complex job. Um, and so, yeah, no reason to, to focus on maybe one part of the job over the other, but I just like to keep that in mind because sometimes I, you know, looking at, other people's posts and you see people posting about giant shows or really complex or fancy this and that. It's good to remember that most of us make our living through doing small, medium sized, all different kinds of shows. Um, and so there's no, no reason not to post about potentially the small show that you're working on. If you want to, I don't need to feel like I have to be something that I'm not because all these jobs are important. Yeah. It's tough. There's a balance there, right? Like there's a typical marketing thing is that like you, you don't, um, you don't show pictures or content of just everything you do. You show the show, the work that you want to get. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's something, uh, there's sense. something to be said sure. for that. Right. Like, no, if, you know, uh, three weeks out of the month, you're doing basic AV breakout shows, but you know, you, you know, you can do and want to be doing larger general sessions. Yeah. You're not going to be posting pictures of, Hey, I'm doing this. Right. But there's, there's other ways of just kind of being, 
Um, even was just taking a picture of like some crew or whatever. Like, hey, working with a great crew at this show today or something like that, right? It doesn't have to be a very large scale specific show. Not everyone's doing a show for 500,000 people or more every day. This doesn't, I'm not, you know? Uh, so, um, so there, there's, there's a, there's a balance there for sure. Okay. So let's talk about, let's talk more about things that you don't like. So if there are some complaints about, um, how people are reaching out to you now that we've gone to the step of, okay, you've seen the work that they're doing. Maybe you've even actually, uh, hired me to work on a show, um, uh, because, you know, you found me on LinkedIn, you know, I'm in, you know, the, the city that you're coming to, um, what are some things that I could do that you don't like in terms of outreach and, and like trying to get more work together? Yeah. So some, some freelancers are pretty good about doing, uh, what people call availability emails, right? Um, I, and I've had conversation with you. I like the flip side of that. I like a blackout list as opposed to, Hey, these are my blackout dates. I'm not available these dates. Um, just because of the way I track it, right? So my regular freelancers, I'm actually tracking all of them on a, on a, on an Excel calendar and I can see by what day they're not available. Because when you tell me what days you are available, I'm just doing the reverse math and taking a, and a, a Sharpie or whatever and blocking out those days that, you know, you're not available, mm-hmm. right? Um, I don't know how other people track it, but that's the way I do it. So um, when I get availability emails, I I typically don't respond to availability emails. And I hope the people who send them don't get offended by that. But just I don't have the capacity to answer all them because I don't have much to respond with other than I'm going to email you or call you when I have something for you, right? Um so, and, and I understand, especially in slower times, you know, you're trying to find work, right? I have never been on the other side of the fence of being a freelancer, hungry, trying to get that work. Um, to me, a reasonable amount of time is no more than once a month uh, and anywhere from one to three. Um, uh, an email every one to three months range, I think, is a good, at least for the volume of work that I'm doing. Like, because, I mean, I spend half of my week or more sometimes just doing labor. If I have a gig, and I need you, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you. Like, I'm not like waiting for you to tell me you're available. For me. Oh, let me, let me see if I can put this guy on, right? Because um, I'm not necessarily looking at my guys and going, oh, what shows can I get them on? It's the opposite. I have these shows. Who's the best fit for this show? Yeah. And then going from that list. Um, go I think what, I'll just interrupt because I think one of the reasons that it's hard to understand personal referral is that it normally doesn't work like a meritocracy. It most often feels like if you are the last person that contacted me, then like, oh, Chris just sent me an email or Chris just called me. Oh, and I have this show. I will think of you before someone else. Um, and so it's it's helpful to know that you, for example, are a little bit, it sounds like you are more methodical in your approach and that you will go through and try to find not just the last person who contacted you, but the best fit by location, experience, right. stuff like that. So that's one of the reasons why I don't need to contact you as much to whereas someone else I really like working with, but you know, is maybe a little bit less methodical. I know like I need to remind them fairly regularly that I'm alive and we like working right. together. And I mean, look, there for sure there's there's um the cities that I'm not we're not doing shows in every month, right? So I might only do a show in the city maybe four times a year. Right. So I'm off the top of my head. I might not remember the person who's available in those city. Right. So if they do email me once every one or three months, it does keep that name. I, I saw my inbox. Oh, yeah. This guy's in that city. Cool. Right. But the, back to what I said earlier. Also, if you're kind of posting regularly, too, you're actually almost in front of me more in a non-invasive way. Right. Uh, I've had some people who are emailing me um sometimes more than once a week every time they got a gig they were updating their availability email okay. to me. it's like <laughs> look i don't need to know you just got booked on a gig you know um uh or they'll list out like all the dates and all the gigs are doing and like what their job is on it and that's typically something that a greener person is doing right uh i don't care what other gigs you're working on for the most part right especially when they were telling me that uh, they were an auto utility on this and i'm a i'm a i'm a i'm a breakout tech on this they what they actually kind of did is let me know that hey this guy is definitely capped here and he's not getting much actual tech work so why would i hire him right now as a tech if if he's that good or or good as he thinks he may be he probably has more actual you know lead tech work right um but like but like i said i still need people who have different skills um at different times uh so yeah so just keeping that whole um 
uh, I think is a balance of making sure people remember your name, but then not being invasive. So it's, you know, and uh, you know, there are guys who like to add, you know, a quick little thing about what they've been doing. You're pretty good about, you know, saying, you know, Hey, I, I you know, I learned this in the last couple of shows or whatever. Oh, by the way, here's my availability. Uh, that's definitely a more personal touch than just an email of here's my dates, you know? Yeah. yeah. And I, I started trying to do that better because you mentioned someone else to me and, and because we're friends, I've been asking you more information about like, like, show me good examples, like who's doing this really well. And so you've shown me like, hey, if you uh, make your calendar really easy to read, then that's easier on me. And if you send me blackout dates instead of availability, that makes it easier on me. So ways that I can make your job easier. And then one of those, you said, hey, I read this guy's email every time because it's usually something entertaining or informative. And I was like, okay, I can try to do that. And so I've been trying to make those more personalized, either something personal about myself that I think is entertaining or something that I learned that I, you know, I know you're really interested in audio too. We both use smart and this kind of stuff. So, so the more personal things I know about you and your interests, the more I can try to, to, you know, make our relationship less formal, I guess. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the other thing that I kind of find annoying, and this again, these are all everything I'm saying about all of this. I can only speak about my experience in the company I'm at, right? And so, um, a pet peeve I have would be like every now and then, if I'm, I can't, really can't find someone local to a city that that I, I don't have a, a name for, I'll put a post out on LinkedIn and be like, "Hey, for instance, we came to Houston. You know, any A ones in Houston?" And I get 14 people commenting, "You know, oh, I'll fly, I'll fly." You know. <sighs> That's not what I asked. That's not what I asked. That's not what I asked. Like I specifically said local too, right? Uh, and uh, it's not a big deal. It just it gets kind of annoying. Of like, look, if I could fly someone, I most likely either already knew someone or I would have flown you. You know, um, so that that's a little annoying. But that's just that's minor. Well, one thing I've started doing that I think people like since I met you and have been talking with you is when I meet new people that I would like to keep working with, I'll say to them. Um, here's what I've done with other project managers or other pe- companies that I'm working with. Do you want me to do the same thing, like a monthly email av- about availability? Um, and if and if so, you know, what's the best way for me to do that? Do you like email? Do, would you prefer me to call you? And I, what I'm just trying to ask them is like, what's the best way to, so that I don't accidentally, yeah. um, you know, uh, annoy you? Like right. some of these it's people. Gonna be, it's going to be different for everyone. Right. I right. I mean, you know. Um, and, uh, so yeah, so it's, and I, I think I, I actually didn't realize this until you and I were talking last night about this was, um, the, the method of if, if we're connected on LinkedIn, uh, or some social channel, um, uh, I keep some of the other ones more private than I do LinkedIn. Um, and, uh, you know, and I'm seeing the work you're doing, you're actually going to be more non-invasively in front of me more often. And I get a mental picture of what you're doing as opposed to just black and white paper email once a month of, hey, I'm available. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's, that's something I think would, would work well. Look, some people don't post at all, and that's fine too. But typically, I already know what their skills are because they're working for me all the time. I'm not, I'm not trying to investigate them. Um, but I'm constantly needing to find new people um, in the cities because I might, you know, I might know four or five engineers in a city, but it's peak busy season and then all four of those guys aren't available because they're good. You know, they're working. Uh, I need that fifth guy, you know, or more. Um, and so it's, uh, I say you can almost never have enough guys in, in each city. Um, but then it actually starts getting difficult because especially in cities where we work a lot, I get concentrated. I'm 10 deep guys. Um, and I want to introduce a new guy into the system, but I have all these other guys too. Cause there is some sense of loyalty as well to my regular guys. Um, not just for the sake of being low, but because they're, you know, they're, they, they know my, they know our gear. They know the IMS way. We're very particular about the way we do things. I know their customer service as well. Um, you know, a lot of people can, can tech, but their customer service is, is, is subpar to what, to what we do. Okay. Yeah. My biggest takeaway is that, you know, be considerate of the kind of communication that, that is helpful to people and how you can like save them time and make their job easier. And, um, and the easiest way to do that is to ask them like, Hey, I want to keep in touch with you. Um, what's the best way for me to do that? Um, Chris, where is the best place for people to follow your work? Well, like we said for the past uh, good bit, uh, LinkedIn is probably the easiest to see my, my work, um, especially uh, yeah. If you're if you're a audio tech in in the U.S. 
yeah, connect with me so we can, I can see what you're doing and, and, and possibly work together. And uh, yeah. Chris, thank you so much for joining me on Sound Design Live. Thanks for having me. Sound Design Live.